Hello and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce Odyssey podcast. I'm here with Andy Hooper from Global E-commerce Experts, and we are going to talk about the e the international e-commerce opportunity, everything about cross-border trade. So, Andy, can you first start off with a very general question? What is do you think is the e-commerce opportunity in 2022 after Brexit and with the world economy just going down the toilet? Yeah, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah. So I think the, the, the key thing to figure is, is that especially post Brexit is that so many people have, you know, sort of threw their toys out the pram. Us typical Brits, we sort of, you know, uh, we were so used to trading with Europe, especially in e-commerce, where it is relatively straightforward. That what happened was, is that we all looked at what we were doing and where there was a few more bits of paperwork and a few bit more legislation we had to jump through. And we all went, Ah, oh, it's too difficult. I can't be bothered. And, you know, there was, don't get me wrong, it was a little bit difficult in places. I totally understand that. But the reality is now that now that the systems and the processes are well documented, it's really straightforward. The opportunity now is about re-engaging your e-commerce brand back into Europe to capitalize on the 500 million people that are in there. Okay. So what would you say, I mean, if you are a e-commerce newbie, right? So, or not an e-commerce newbie, say you've got like a business, which or a brand, which has been selling online for a bit. Um, what are the steps that you would go through to start selling internationally? So we've got a basic seven step process, but the first few steps are really around the first one's market research, understanding the market to make sure your product can be sold both from a compliance point of view, but also demands point of view in the market that you're going to. The second one is around compliance. Make sure your business is compliant and make sure your product is compliant. And there's a whole host of different things in there. And then the third plate, the third key thing is about having the right marketplace strategy to enable you to sell as much products as possible. So depend on your products is going to depend on the best way and the best route to market for those products. Okay, and let's see. Three key. Let's let's go through these. They, they, they seem like very good points. Let's go through them one at a time, then, shall we? <laughs> First, I mean, let's talk a bit about Brexit. I mean, I found that you know because I run an e-commerce business, um, the things that used to work well don't work so well anymore. So we used to ship the stuff, for example, from the UK into into Europe, and we just yeah. found out the extra delay and the problems. Though it should work smoothly, it doesn't really seem to work smoothly. Yep. Is that what you found as well? Yeah, so in many ways, we were relatively fortunate because the majority of our clients, 75%, are all based outside of Europe, and that includes the UK. So they were typically states-based clients expanding into the UK and Europe. So we were already well documented with the systems and processes for dealing with clients selling into those marketplaces. But what we found was, was that Germany particularly were probably the biggest pain in the backside and everyone's perception was they wanted to expand into Germany first because Germany was the one that was is technically the bigger market and therefore seems like the biggest option but it's the biggest headache shipping to so coming back to your point there about you know essentially the logistics what our clients are doing to successfully do this is They're sending shipments directly from, if they're made outside of region, into the UK and into Europe and and having a base locally. So you need a 3PL. The ones that are doing this really well have a 3PL base in both the UK and in the Europe somewhere. And typically that's in Netherlands because it's the gateway. The Dutch are a bit more like, come on, guys, in you come. As whereas the Germans are like, you're not coming in unless you can do X, Y, Z. Oh, and then dot the I and cross the T. Um, okay. So that's where we're seeing the real difference happen right now. Okay, so let's just talk about logistics to begin with. I think it's a good place to start. So, I mean, obviously, the, the, there's, there's fulfillment by Amazon, and that does, you know, um, multi-channel fulfillment. Do you find that that would, would you think that something like, you know, sending products into, into Amazon, which is a very convenient solution, and you, you get the prime eligibility, totally. is that the, a, a good logistics solution or would you say that you need to do that and also have another 3pl so i think so we would suggest that depend on the size of the seller is going to depend on what to do okay so if you're if you've got the availability to be able to order a decent amount of inventory then 
what your best solution is, is by shipping into a 3PO in, in Europe and then fulfill it and then putting half of that stock directly into Amazon, presuming your IPI score, your stock levels are all, all, all available, right? So, and then top up from in region, essentially, basically into Amazon. Okay. The advantage of that is that if you start fulfilling on other platforms, you've also got a 3PL that you can fulfill direct to consumer should you need. And okay. that's the way that people really find the most useful way of doing it. Otherwise, what tends to happen is they send stock directly from the UK, let's say, into Amazon in Germany. And then what happens is, is the stock runs out or it's close to running out. They're like, OK, send another carton or another pallet to Germany. And then what happens? Because you're shipping pallets, everyone hates shipping pallets. No one. It's not easy. And shipping into Amazon Europe in pallets is the biggest pain in the backside. So you're not really having the best route in. And then, of course, your stock goes out of stock because Amazon couldn't inbound it quick enough and, and, you, and you, you end up losing your performance. So okay. that's where it really, really works by having something locally. Okay. So what I also in a case of compliance, right? Um, I mean, what are the, I suppose, presumably you've got people in the UK that, that, at least historically, I mean, I don't know, I don't know whether there's, you know, it's getting, the, the legislation presumably is diverging all the time. Um, I'm guessing that you've got, say, UK-based clients that probably are mostly EU compliance, and then you've got people from outside the UK. What is the, you know, I'm, you know compliance is a bit of a minefield. What is the best way of making sure your products are compliant? So if, if your product is compliant for the EU, the UK and the European regulations, despite Brexit, are in most cases the same with some local tweaks, right? Because what happened was in the Brexit deal, basically they put a competition rule in that basically said you can't diverge too far away from what we're doing because you'll get a competitive advantage. And therefore, what will happen is, is you're breaking the trade agreement. So actually, one the, the agreements have stayed pretty much the same and for two reasons. One for that and two, there's been so many other things happening. They haven't had a chance to even look at it because mm. all of their focus has been on COVID, for example. So mo in most cases, if your products, if you're selling your product in the UK or Europe, in most cases, your product is going to be compliant in, in the region already. There, there is are it, some differences okay. you need. To, sorry, there are some differences you need to factor in. Like, if you're selling a you know, a product, you might need to have some translations done on the product. Now, you didn't really have to worry about that post before Brexit, but you do need to make sure your products translate in local language. And if you sell supplements and things like that specifically, or cosmetics, there are some individual things you need to do. But mm -hmm. I would say if you sell some of those, then you probably need to get in contact. But broadly your product's going to be compliant if they're in one region or the other. The only thing you'll need to consider is if you need a responsible person or an authorized person or an authorized representative. So there are things you need to consider. And before part of that market research we talked about right at the beginning is understanding what your product is and whether there's any regulations it needs to fall under to make sure you're compliant. Okay. So do you think of I it, mean, is it the case with Brexit that we voted for something which we didn't really actually want in the first place? <laughs> you know, we, we voted we voted to have the ability to to diverge from European laws and then we haven't diverged. Uh, basically, uh, yes, because uh, the deal basically says we can't diverge away from what they do too much. I mean, right. we've got a little bit of wiggle room, but if we decide that, for example, well, and actually, sorry, let me just backtrack there. The other side of that is if you're a stakes based business and let's say you are a grocer or you're a beauty brand or whatever it happens to be, then the problem with that is that what happens is, is if you want to send your products to Europe, you're not going to start sending products to the UK specifically or into Europe potentially. So the, the regulations need to be similar like for food and things like that but in order to transport everything. In, and keep the competition, but also ease of movement of goods, they need to stay similar because of that. So you did we vote for something we didn't get yet, probably, but that's probably another another episode. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems it seems to me that we 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 voted for something and if we thought hard about it, we didn't really actually want. But um anyway. The uh, okay, so what do you think are the 
I don't know, in order of in order of how you would do them, what do you think are the best channels that people should address? I mean, sales channels, eBay, sales. Amazon, et cetera. Yeah, so I think the first thing is, where are you currently selling? So if you're already on Amazon, for example, it makes real sense to stick with Amazon when you're expanding into Europe because they've already got established marketplaces across, well, the world, right? So if you're already selling on one, it makes perfect sense to do that. The downside to doing that is that Amazon isn't necessary. whilst it's easy, Amazon isn't necessarily the biggest, market, biggest marketplace in other countries yet. So nice. when, you're, when you're going to Germany, France, Poland, Netherlands, Australia, actually, you, Amazon isn't the biggest. So what we tend to find is that actually the best approach is to start with what you know, because it makes your life easy. But as you're building out what you're doing, typically an omni-channel approach is really critical in order so that you can expand successfully. Because if you're going into one new marketplace, but let's say Amazon's only got 20% market share, in order for you to build your sales, it, it almost may not be worth it if you're only relying on Amazon. So if you're going to the Netherlands, as an example, you know, Amazon is tiny in the Netherlands, but bold.com is what everyone uses. Mm. So actually, if you're in the Netherlands and you've already got stock there, well, it makes perfect sense to be on bold.com. And depending on what you do, how you do it in the software you use, typically that's a relatively easy approach. If you're using Limworks, for example, and you know a lot of people use Limworks, well, they've got connections into virtually everything. <laughs> so actually, it makes it really straightforward to do some of these things. Is there some additional connectivity you need to do? Of course there is. But, you know, the first thing is to start with what you know and what you understand. And as you build out that is to look at other opportunities and look at an omni-channel approach. Okay. So what about um, trademarks? Is that something which people need to worry about? So definitely. So, and, uh, well, let me, well, so let me just backtrack that. So yes, if you haven't already got a trademark, if you've already got a European trademark that was done before Brexit, you get grandfather rights, which means you've got a trademark in both the UK and in Europe or in the union, should I say. Now, now, if you want a trademark, you need to register for a trademark in both the UK and in the European Union or wherever you want to trade. So basically, before Brexit, you got it for the price of one. And now you've got to have two trademarks because of the split. So but going forwards, we know and as you know, brand owners and specialists in in you know, in e-commerce, the brands that are winning right now are exactly that. They're brands and they are typically ones that have got a trademark. The white label quick and go jobs are working really, really well, but they need to have a trademark in order to start scaling their business. We're seeing the ones without a trademark slowly drop off the index because they don't have, you know, um, they don't have, you know, basically decent content anymore because the brand on Amazon is nowhere near as what it could be with enhanced brand content, for example. Okay. Yeah, because it's not, I mean, it, it, there are a lot of, um, yeah, when you go into Amazon, you will just see the same product under multiple sellers, and some of them are very well branded, and some are very poorly branded. Yes. So, yeah. um, so what about okay, tax? I love tax. It always makes me feel, you know, I if I'm trying to sound clever, I always say, have you thought of the tax implications? So, what are the tax implications? Yeah. Okay. So, good point. So, there are there's different ways of doing things, and tax can mean different things to different people. The bottom line is, is if you are selling in a country, the government wants some form of cash in return for that as a thank you for selling in their country. That's the best way of looking at it. And there's different ways to do it. And there's better ways depending on where you're based. Now, if you're a UK based seller, that doesn't mean to say you need to set up an entity in Europe in order to pay corporation tax, director's tax, all the, all the different tax that we would pay as a business owner here in the UK. The easiest way of doing that is taking your UK entity and registering it for VAT in the European countries. That way, the, the tax that you'll pay is the VAT on the sales of your products. So that's the easiest and simplest way of doing that for the majority of sellers 
that are selling cross border. Now that also has an impact if you're a states based business. If you're based in the states, you can still register your states based business for VAT in the UK or in Germany or in France. You don't need to set up corporations across the world. We've got in this process of, oh, well, in order to set up in another country, I've got to have a business. And the reality is you don't. You just need to have a way of making money for the government. And the way of doing that is having a VAT. Am I right, am I right in saying, okay, because I mean, we were interested in selling, we used to sell on Bol and we're interested in selling on Bol again. And to sell on Bol again, we need an EU entity. Okay, so there's different ways of doing those things. So you don't necessarily need an EU entity. What you might need is a responsible person in those jurisdictions for those products. And there's a very okay. difference between an entity and because if you think about all of the overseas sellers, they can't, they won't just won't have entities. And the word entity actually is quite grey. So if you look at the letter of the law, an entity could be a corporation or a business. But it could also be a business that is registered for tax purposes in that region, which, of course, if you were VAT registered, you would be. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the, the word entity slightly is slightly grey and depending on the country has a slight different meaning. So in the UK, actually, that there, there, there's a there's trading standards are currently having a discussion, let's call it, with government about what an entity is, because all these e-commerce sellers are sending stock in and saying, I've got an entity because I'm VAT registered. Well, the reality is they don't have an entity in UK British law. They might be VAT registered, but they also need a responsible person party, let's call it, for their products in Europe. And that opens another can of worms. OK, so, yeah, it, it, it is the, the answer to these things are, are, are always complicated. So what would you say? OK, so expanding outside Europe, right? Um, forgetting about we've already discussed, you know, Amazon in various countries. What would be I mean, have you got experience of selling into China or other more exotic, more exotic um, jurisdictions? Yeah, so most of our work is in Europe. We focus solely on that, which global e-commerce experts actually doesn't do us any justice sometimes. Um, we've, we've focused on the UK market and European market, to be fair. Um, we've got a little bit of advice and information that we've gained from working with our sellers. We've got about 2,000 sellers we work with. And across all the different services that we provide, we've worked and provide solutions for some of those, but typically in the Amazon markets. But we're by no means experts yet in all of those so we focused really on that sort of thing first and then from there we've moved on but really europe is our key market and outside of that you know that's where we focused okay right so it's it's uh because i know my experience is tmall is it's very hard to sell into to oh, where sorry tmall in china okay yes yeah i mean that whole expanding into china is a logistical nightmare but okay so yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to jump through a um yeah I think I think you have to jump through a lot of hoops to 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 do it I mean it it's it's um no one has tried harder to sell into China than me and no one has failed more completely well it's, you'll you'll find a way in sooner or later well I don't know and the problem is that you need to have whereas you know if you want to sell into you know let's take you know France or somewhere you can set up your own Amazon France account you can set up your own CDesk account etc and you can basically run it yourself. Yep. Right? Whereas if you want to sell into Tmall, you need to get, um, uh, you need to 20, pay a 25 grand deposit. Uh, you need to go for a Tmall partner and they start at about five grand a month. And whilst that's not, you know, it just means the whole thing has to work a lot better, doesn't it? Yep. If you start already start at five grand's worth of cost. Yep. And yeah. That, that... And that's a bit like setting up an entity in Germany. And now you, for Germany, you have to put 25,000 euros in the bank to set up a business in Germany. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I know where you're going with that. I mean, that just seems bonkers, if I'm honest. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think the thing, unfortunately, you see China says that they want to, it, it's just a barrier to entry, isn't it, really? I mean, it's, yeah. to, it's just to basically, they, they, they don't want people selling on their platform from overseas, not really. And so they basically enable you to do it, but they it really you know, you have to be quite serious about it yeah. to do it. And I think that, um, you know, you have to, they, they just create a whole lot of hoops for you to jump through. And I mean, my experience also is the shipping into China is a bit of a nightmare. 
Um, well, shipping well. out of China at the moment is a nightmare as well. Well, I don't know. It's all a, it's all, it's all, yeah, it's all a bit of a nightmare. Okay. So what, I mean, okay. What would be your, I don't know, should we say top 10 tips for selling internationally? Let's start with number one. Number one, uh, understand the market you're going to and have a broad strategy or understanding of what that market is and, and um, to make sure your product's going to sell. Okay. So how would you, what would that, what, what tools would you use to do that? Uh, Helium 10, Jungle Scout, you know, a whole load of different software to have a look and see what's already selling, what's not selling. And then use a partner perhaps in those countries that knows the market that can give you some advice and some support um, and, and really get a flavor of the country, understand okay. what that looks like and, and what you, know, what's the weather like in the country? You know, you know, there are certain products that, you know, are going to sell better in other countries. You know, if you try and sell ski equipment here in the UK, well, you're only going to sell that at certain times when people are going on holiday to go skiing. There's no real skiing. Apologies to Glen Shee in Scotland and everything else. I know there are some, I know there's some skiing, right? I don't want to defend anybody, but you know, the, you, it's not going to be, but if you're selling the ski equipment in you know, France and Italy, actually you might have a much better market in some of those areas because the mountain ranges and the, the skiing is much better or Canada or Northern or North, you know, certain parts of the States. So there's going to be different places to sell products. They're going to work better. Okay, great. Good. Well, first question. Point two, make sure your product is compliant with the regulations you're going to. Okay. Point three, make sure your business is compliant in the country that you're fulfilling <laughs> from. You see okay, point, point four. Uh, point four. Uh, make sure your launch strategy is right for the product. So identify the right marketplace for you. Okay. Point, point five. Make sure you've got a fulfillment partner or a, a ability to you know, receive stock, fulfill stock, return stock, prime buffer stock into Amazon relatively straightforward. So if you're out of region, you know, if you're in the UK and you're selling to FBA, you might have your own garage or your own warehouse you're working with. But if you're going to a different country, you're not going to have that ability. So make sure you're working with a, a, a reputable 3PL that can support you to make that happen. Okay. I mean, do you think, is it possible to send stuff from the UK into Europe? Or is that just totally. not? Yeah. It is totally. The problem that people are finding is that, one, the paperwork's a complete pain in the backside. So if paperwork is a problem, actually what we're trying to do is make sure that um, you, you've got plenty of time to do that. And it depends on your IPI score and your performance or depend on when you can send that in. I mean, like, I mean, sending single orders. So, you know, is it possible? Would you, would you think it's practical to send a single order into Europe? Apologies. So the answer is yes. The downside to that is when the customer receives it, they might have to pay tax and duties on that. So what happens is, is the customer receives it. Like, oh, thanks very much. Oh, by the way, you've got £42 to pay in tax and duties because it's come from the UK. So that's the problem with doing that. I mean, if you're IOSS registered, though. So there, there are, you can make that happen. Yes. So you okay. can do that and then the, you'll then pay, take that in. You'll need to base that into the cost of the price of the product. Okay. Point six, point six. Point six, um, uh, point six, point six. I do customs duty. <laughs> uh, well, Great yeah, okay. So, channels. <laughs> yeah, so let, 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 that's a really good one. Have a solid um, shipping and customs process that you trust that can either do, that can do a multitude of things, whether it be deep sea from China, if that's what you need, or into, you know, into um, country cross-border trade between here and Europe. Okay. Point seven. Let's see. Are we... yeah. How about customer service? Yeah. Customer service is a good one, isn't it? I mean, that, you know, but to be honest, for a lot of brands, the customer service piece is really around, you're making sure you can have, you can talk to the people in the right language. But quite honestly, actually, unless you're an absolutely huge brand, actually the volume of that is relatively straightforward because Amazon's done a great job of doing a lot of that for people now. You know, Amazon's got this algorithm and thing that can basically take a lot of that away. And actually the amount of customer services is drastically reduced. So I think I would say that the, 
for me, number seven would be about is how you grow and scale what you're currently doing. So how do you have an omni-channel approach? How do you um, scale that business in that region? Do you have distributors? Do you have retail? You know, how are you making sure that you're on every marketplace or making sure the translation for your product is absolutely completely nailed? Okay. Do you find, I mean, my experience with Google Translators is actually pretty good for cust- most customer service. Yeah. I, I, Surprisingly we good. Yeah. We've, we've, but, we've used that definitely. Yeah. I found it. Okay. So we got to what we on. We on, was that 0.7 or 0.8? <laughs> 0.7. Oh, and I think we probably wrapped seven and eight. Oh, no, sure. there, <laughs> okay. Are we done enough? Yeah, we, I, reckon we, so. I reckon that's Okay. Well, I'll let you off. You, you, you made a valiant <laughs> effort. Okay. Good. Day. Right. Last question. Here we go. It's a fluffy question. What has inspired you recently? What's inspired me recently? Do you know what? We've, um, we've, we went through Q4 and like a lot of e-commerce brands, you know, Q4 is chaos. And, you know, we just moved into it. We'd moved to a new warehouse in September and we've got 12,000 pallet base and we're fulfilling you thousands of FBA orders into Amazon, thousands of uh, direct to consumers. And quite honestly, you know, in Q4, we got absolutely nailed. And, you know, we did some amazing things, but we also did some things that we weren't overly impressed by. Um, you know, our lack of cust- our ability to deal with some of our customers was really, really poor because we didn't, for example, we weren't getting forecasts from our clients. So we had one client that just had 20 containers that we knew nothing about. Right. So it was our fault because we didn't do accurate forecasts with our clients and our clients didn't give us those forecasts. That's our fault, not the client's fault. Um, but since then, we've had a program of change here in the office for the last, the first quarter of this year, the last three months. And the ability, so what's inspired me has been the team here. And I know it's a bit cliche, but the team here have absolutely inspired me where we've gone from a really, really trying period to turn around our systems, our processes, our structure to make an, a truly epic service, which is what we inspire to deliver for our clients. Now we're not going to know that until Q4 next this year, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the turnaround that our team have had in that period has been you know, staggering. The, 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 okay. the, the systems and processes change. And anyone listening to business will recognize that as you scale and grow a business, the biggest problem is letting stuff go, giving it to people. And when you start getting north of 50 people, that becomes harder and harder and harder to do. And the systems and processes are absolutely critical. And that, that, so the team have inspired me. But anyone listening, as you're scaling and growing, make sure your systems and processes don't outgrow you. Or you Excellent. don't outgrow That's good, that's good advice process. to end with. Andy, look, it's been great getting your advice on e-commerce um, um, cross-border trade. And no problem. It's been great. Check out great your website. Okay. Excellent. Thanks, Thank you very bye much. Bye.